Experiment 13 in Chem 1211 is titled Freezing Point Depression. And in this experiment, we're going to see colligative properties in action and investigate the effect of a solute on the freezing point of water. Freezing point depression and its colligative cousins, boiling point elevation and vapor pressure lowering are really remarkable properties because they don't depend on the identity of the solute, only the number of particles that are involved. So in this video, we'll explore a little bit of that theoretical background and talk a little bit about what you'll do in the laboratory to investigate this fascinating phenomenon. The most amazing thing about colligative properties is that they don't depend on the identity of the solute, only on the number of solute and solvent particles involved. How is this possible? Well, the answer lies in the thermodynamic definition of entropy and the fact that the entropy of an ideal solution has nothing to do with the identity of the particles, just their relative numbers. That entropy difference between a pure liquid and a solution containing components of two different types is what ultimately leads to the colligative properties such as freezing point depression. So let's take a look at how that works. Imagine we started with, say, 20 molecules of blue solvent, and to that we added a few molecules of red solute. Notice that we haven't specified the identity of these particles, we've just called them blue or red, and they can really be anything, but notice that the blue is in the majority, it's the solvent here, and the red is in the minority, and it's thus the solute. Because the left-hand situation includes only one type of particle, that left-hand situation has lower entropy than the situation on the right where two types of particles are involved. I like the way Atkins describes it when he says that the chance of pulling out a blue particle in the left-hand collection is 100%. It's only made of blue particles. That chance goes down and there's more randomness in a sense because of that in the right-hand situation where we have two different types of particles involved. This increase in entropy that comes naturally with any dissolution process has some fascinating effects that are independent of the identity of the solute molecules. So let's think about how entropy depends on the mole fraction of the solute X sub I. Mole fraction is defined as the ratio of the number of moles of that component, the solute in this case, those red solute molecules, divided by the total number of moles of everything that's in the solution, which is usually just the solute plus the solvent numbers of moles. As we increase x sub i, we're increasing the fraction of red molecules within the solution. And what we find is, because of this idea of increasing randomness, entropy increases as we increase the mole fraction of solute up to 0.5. Now past 0.5, we have more solute molecules than solvent molecules, and so at that point, the two kind of switch roles, and the entropy actually starts to decrease again, but this is the most important regime for our purposes. And most solutions actually spend their time way on the left-hand side of mole fraction and have a very small mole fraction of the solute relative to the solvent. The colligative properties that are based on temperature can really be traced back to free energy, or G, which remember is equal to enthalpy, H, minus T, S, where S is the entropy. What then is the effect of dissolving a solute on the free energy, on the G, of a solution? Well, we can see that there's a negative sign associated with S, and so as S increases, as we dissolve the solute, the free energy decreases. What this means intuitively, in terms of a chemical mindset, is that the solution phase becomes more stable as we add solute to it. The lower G value is associated with a more stable liquid solution phase. Intuitively, then, we can see where this is going. If the liquid phase becomes more stable, that means it's more permanent over a wider temperature range. So that suggests that the boiling point should be elevated and the freezing point depressed so that the overall range of the liquid solution phase becomes wider upon addition of the solute. We can actually see this if we look at G as a function of temperature and we plot the curve for the liquid solution phase and either the vapor phase or the solid phase, depending on whether we're dealing with boiling or freezing. So let's look at boiling first. Since G is equal to H minus TS, the curve of G versus temperature is linear and downward sloping, since S is going to be positive. 
For the pure liquid, it might look something like this, but for the gas, it's much steeper in a negative direction because the molar entropy of a gas, S for a gas, is much larger than it is for a liquid. Because the molar entropies are different, the slopes are different, and these two curves will intersect at a point. Where they intersect, the free energy of the vapor is equal to the free energy of the liquid. And this is the definition, the thermodynamic definition, of the boiling point. The two free energies are equal, so there's an equilibrium between the vapor and the liquid. What happens now if we take some solute and dissolve it in the pure liquid? Well, as we just saw, that's going to raise the entropy of the solution and thus decrease the G value. So the entire curve is going to be shifted downward. Notice that this has the effect of pushing to the right the intersection point between the vapor or gas and liquid phases. And this is just boiling point elevation in action, right? The boiling point of the solution, which has an overall lower G, is shifted to the right or to a greater temperature than the boiling point of the pure liquid phase we can recognize that a similar idea is responsible for freezing point depression. So if we again plot H minus TS for the pure liquid phase, we'd get something like this, a downward sloping line, since S must be positive. And for the pure solid phase, we now have a flatter line than the liquid phase, since the entropy of the solid phase is less than the entropy of the liquid phase. Again, because the two slopes are different, they'll have to intersect at a point, and this point is, by definition, the freezing or melting point. This is where the free energy of the solid is equal to the free energy of the liquid. What happens if we shift the blue curve downward by dissolving solute in the pure liquid to create a solution? Well, in that case, the point of intersection moves to the left because we've shifted the curve downward. On the black H minus TS curve for the solution, you can see that the point of intersection falls at a lower temperature than the intersection point for the pure solid and pure liquid. And this represents a decrease in the freezing point of the solution relative to the freezing point of the pure liquid. It's pretty remarkable that we never had to appeal to the molecular structure of the solute or solvent to come to this conclusion. We can simply trace its origin back to the entropy difference between a pure liquid and a solution. The latter is always higher in entropy. Before we get into freezing point depression in more detail, I wanted to briefly mention two measures of concentration that are going to be really important when thinking about colligative properties, mole fraction and molality. Mole fraction we've already seen, it's just the ratio of the number of moles of a component to the total number of moles of everything within a solution, which in a simple two-component solution is just the solute and the solvent. So we can represent that as N sub I for component I divided by the sum over all of the components of the number of moles of each. Molality is the ratio of the number of moles of, say, component I to the mass of the solvent, M sub solvent, in kilograms here. Molality is really useful because empirically we find that freezing point depression is proportional to molality, and it's fairly easy to measure, and it makes it convenient to prepare solutions. In addition, molality is independent of temperature, which makes it ideal when working with temperature-dependent colligative properties like freezing point depression and boiling point elevation. Theoretically, mole fraction is proportional to the temperature change due to freezing point depression, but mole fraction and molality are very closely related and tend to be almost proportional to one another, and so molality is approximately proportional to that change in temperature delta Tf. It's close enough that empirically, when we do empirical measurements, we don't really notice a difference between the two. Because of the practical convenience of molality relative to mole fraction, we'll use it throughout this experiment to represent concentrations. Note that molarity is inappropriate to use here because molarity is temperature dependent. The volume of the solution varies with temperature. Now let's dig into the details of freezing point depression. For non-electrolytes, what we find is that the change in temperature due to the addition of a solute is equal to some constant, K sub F, and you'll see this called the cryoscopic constant or the freezing point constant, times the molality of the solution. So, intuitively, the greater the number of moles of solute present, the larger is the delta T F, and that's what we'd expect based on our prior discussion. Remember that B is the molality here. For electrolytes, ionic electrolytes that break apart into multiple particles when dissolved in solution, the equation is a little bit different. 
the change in temperature here is equal to I, we'll get to what I is in a second, times the freezing point constant times the molality of the solution. I is what's called the Vantoff factor, and it's important to include because we recognize that an ionic salt containing more than one ion within it is going to break up into multiple particles, and we need to count all of those particles if we want to get the freezing point depression right. So for example, let's imagine an ionic salt composed of three particles, something like CaCl2, calcium chloride. When we dissolve calcium chloride in water, we get two chloride ions and one calcium 2 plus ion for a total of three particles. The total moles of particles in solution is not equal to the number of moles of CaCl2, but that number times three, and the Vantoff factor takes that into account. So I here is three. The Vantoff factor is simply equal to the number of particles we get when we dissolve the solute in solution. In the experiment, we'll measure the freezing point depression due to dissolution of the solute, and we'll know the molality of the solute and the freezing point constant, which can be looked up. The idea then is to calculate I, calculate an experimental I, and compare it to what our theoretical prediction would be based on the identity of the salt. Don't be afraid and don't get worried if you see large variation here. Eyes are known to vary widely and can depend profoundly on the concentration of the solution. They tend to become more unreliable as the concentration of the solution goes up. To actually measure these delta TF values, we're going to need to obtain freezing points. And to do that, we're essentially going to cool a solution down over time and look at how its temperature changes over time. It's important to be able to look at a temperature versus time curve and be able to identify the freezing regime, where the freezing is taking place and at what temperature it's taking place. This can happen in a number of different ways, and depending on how exactly the freezing occurs, you might get different results. So let's take a look at three typical situations that you'll see. The first and most simple situation involves cooling of the solution to a point, at which point the temperature flattens out, and after freezing is complete, the temperature continues to decrease. This regime in the middle, where the temperature is not changing, is a place where released heat is coming from the freezing process. And so we can recognize the freezing regime just as the flat portion of this curve. Not all curves will look this way. In fact, quite a few will have a little region where the temperature of the solution appears to dip below the freezing point before it comes back up and reaches a flat region. Don't be fooled by this little dip. It's what's called a super cooling region. The solution is still liquid, but is actually colder than its freezing point. Once it sort of realizes, in a sense, that it's colder than its freezing point, it starts to freeze, and the temperature increases a little bit until it flattens out. And that region of flat temperature, again, is where we're going to identify the freezing point. The most complicated situation involves a curve in which there is no flat region at all, something like the black curve you see here. We can recognize a supercooling region in this because the temperature dips below the apparent freezing point and comes back up. But since there's no flat region, how do we actually identify the freezing point? Well, the way to do it here is to imagine the slope of the curve before the supercooling region and after the supercooling region and kind of extend the lines out until they intersect. Here I've done that with the blue dotted line. Where the blue dotted line, which is the right-hand side projected back, where that intersects the start of the curve, that's the freezing point you should record. 